since the last lecture we have been looking at abstractions and refinement so let me briefly recapitulate what we had uh, discussed in the last lecture and then take it from there and complete that section on counter example guided abstraction refinement so to start with uh, let us remember what we were doing in the last class that given uh, design m we find that this m is too large for us to do model checking on this m directly so what we do is that out of the set of variables that are there so the variables in m are split into two types of variables the invisible ones and the visible ones right so these are invisible variables and these are visible variables so we just choose a set of visible variables and then abstract m to a smaller machine m dash right which is defined only over the visible variables v right? invisible variables do not appear here right so how does this take place suppose the original originally you had two states 1 1 0 1 1 1 and here you have another state 1 0 0 1 1 1 okay now if you say that these three are my visible variables and these are invisible variables then these two states will merge and then then uh, okay uh, the other way around actually if these are the visible ones and these are the invisible ones then these two states will merge right because in terms of the visible variables they are the same right so they will merge so in that way we get an abstract state machine m dash okay and then we had the result that if there is a property verify and m models verify right okay we check verify on m dash right we don't know whether m models verify we check verify on m dash and the theorem tells us that if m dash models verify then it implies that m also models verify and how is this guaranteed because by virtue of the abstraction every trace that is there in m a corresponding trace is there in m dash right so therefore if m dash has a superset of possible traces of m and therefore if the property holds on all of those traces then it obviously holds on the subset of traces that belongs to m so that is why we had this result and the converse is not true so we can have the situation that there is some counter example trace here in m dash but corresponding to that there is no trace in m okay and therefore we need to refine the abstraction so that this counter example does not come up again so we need to refine the abstraction in such a way that the same counter example is not produced once again so if we look at the slides here this is the abstraction function h which clubs several states of the original state machine into uh, states of the abstract state machine right and then we saw but okay so this shows the abstraction so suppose we make x1 x2 are the only two visible variables these are the two visible ones and these are the two invisible ones right so because the visible portion is similar so all these four states gets clubbed into one state of the abstract state machine right now if you look at this thing now that 
this is the set of bad states right so really speaking there is no path from the set of initial state or from the initial state to a bad state right however for these abstract states how do we put the transitions because there is a transition from some state in this state to some state in this state like this or this therefore we will put a transition from here to here right okay if there is a transition from a state in that state to another transition in that state that will translate into a loop here right so similarly for this loop we have this right then there is a transition from this side to this this is there and also there is one from this side to this side namely this one okay so we will have another transition here and then again from here to here we have a transition we have a transition internally so again a self loop and again a self loop here when we have the transition from here to here and then we have the self loop here okay now in this abstract state machine there is a path from the initial state to the so now our task was that given this counter example trace we try to reproduce that in the original state machine so we start a search from here and using this trace we try to find out the counter example here but the search terminates because there is no transition from this side to that side okay so this forms the set of dead end states okay from which we cannot go to the other side and we have to separate out the dead end states from the states which are from which we can reach the bad states okay so so this shows the search for the corresponding to the counter example which ends in a dead end state and we are not we are not being able to produce a transition from any this state to any state on this side right so that's shown by the cut yes so if we have a counter example we can start in a original model hmm. so if we if we can start on the original model why not we do in the first no no in the first time you cannot do it because then you will have to find out the counter example and do it and for that the state space will be very large here what is happening is if you notice the way that we are doing the search for the counter example we are unrolling the transition relation as in bounded model checking and then restricting it to the counter example so visible of si is equal to ci this restriction keeps it constraint right so whether you are doing it with vdds or sat you can uh, constrain the relation by the counter example right that's why your search space remains contained so you are not just looking for any refutation of the property you are looking for exactly a trace which matches with your trace right so you know the values of the visible variables in each state right so this this is called the failure state and then this is the dead end state and this this is called a bad state right now we have to separate out the dead end states from the bad states that's the goal right now there are many ways of doing that the approach that we are trying to see here is to decide which variables to be made visible so that this separation can be done okay so the set of dead end states and bad states should be separated into different abstract states that's the goal now let's see what we are doing here is that we separated out this dead end state with 
the rest of the states. So, in this abstraction, we will find that there is no path from this to this. Why? Because there is no transition between this and this. So, you will have transitions from here to here, here to here, okay, this one also, but none from here to here. And then you will have transitions from here to here, and all the self loops will also be there, right? But this transition will not be there. So, in the abstraction, we have ruled out that counter example. Now, formally defining what is the set of dead end states? It is the set of states that are reachable from the start state to the transition relation, right? That defines the set of dead end states. So, uh, I S1 which is the initial uh, condition, state condition and conjunction of R S i S i plus 1 for i varies to 1 to f minus 1, S f is the bad state, this one, this is S f, right. So, for each of these states, okay, I, I have R S i S i plus 1 and conjunction from i equal to 1 to f visible S i is equal to C i. So, what am I actually uh, trying to do here? I am trying to find out those states which can be reachable from the in start state through the transition relation. Okay. So, that defines and, and also for in each of those states, uh, the visible part of the state must match with C i. Right. So, it is the set of trace, uh, states which belong to the paths which corresponds to the failure trace. See, this is a counter example trace generated out of the abstraction. We are trying to find out all those states that belong to each of these abstract states of the uh, of the original machine. Okay. Is that clear? English? Not completely clear. What we are trying to do here is we are trying to find out what is the set of dead end states. Okay. Dead end states includes this whole stuff actually. Right. So, we are trying to find out that those states that can be reachable from the initial state okay, through the transition relation. All right. So, I take I S I I S 1 what does this this set gives me the set of initial states okay this what di does this give, give me that from i equal to f minus 1 right r si si plus 1 okay what is si si is a state which belongs to the ith state here right and S i plus 1 is the one which belongs to the next this thing. Okay. And i equal to 1 to f visible S i should be equal to C i. So, these S i should be chosen in such a way that the visible part of those states is equal to C i. Okay. So, let us take the i th state here. Okay. So, this only has this the valuation of the state variables here is C i. Okay, this is the state C i. Okay. Now, remember that this is an abstraction. So, it has only the visible variables of the original set of states. So, if you choose a state S i here, then the visible part of S i should match with this. Otherwise, this state does not correspond to the abstract state C i. Right. For example, if there is some state here, uh, some state here, for example, this state does not correspond to C i. Right. So, this this is saying that that S i belongs to this. Right. And this one says that there is a transition from S i to some S i plus 1 here. Hmm. 
and the bad states are those states where the where they, they, they must the bad states must be ones which belong to SF first of all CF okay so this is the state F where we reach the uh, we could not proceed with the counter example we could not find out a similar trace in the machine we got stuck here right so what are the bad states the bad states are the ones which have some next state okay in SF plus one so it is a state SF, SF plus 1 such that SF belongs to CF and SF plus, one, SF plus 1 belongs to CF plus 1. So, this is my CF abstract state CF, this is my abstract state CF plus 1 okay. and I am looking for a pair SF, SF plus 1 such that visible part of SF is equal to CF and visible part of uh, SF plus 1 is equal to CF plus 1, right. So, those which have transitions from this side to this side are the ones which are which corresponds to the bad states, right. Yeah. Now, in both of these what I did not mention is that finally, the set of states that you are looking at is this intersection your uh, CF, okay. So, mainly you see here I did not say that what is finally being taken out of this, this, this is going to be satisfied by some valuations of S1 through SI through SF, right. Then out of these you take those which intersect with C f right that gives you the set of dead end states. Similarly, here you take the intersection of this with C f and that gives you the set of bad states right. Now, let us look at the separation problem. So, we have this uh, suppose this is the this is a dead end state and these are bad states. Now, this the dark part is the uh, visible part and the lighter part is the invisible part, right. So, these are the visible variables, these are the invisible, this is the visible variables, these are the invisible. Now, the visible part obviously is all the same because they all belong to the same abstract state, right. They differ in the invisible part. So, essentially what we are trying to find out is we are trying to find out which of these invisible variables to select so that we can distinguish between the dead end states and the bad states, right, okay. And we want to keep this, so find the subset of, subset u of i that separates between all pairs of dead end and bad states and make them visible. We want to keep u small, why? because the more number of variables that you bring into your system, the size of the abstract state machine will grow and you will again start having capacity problems, right. So, we want to bring in as few variables as possible. So, here suppose I want to distinguish between these two states. So, I can choose this variable, then for that variable d1 is 1, b1 is 0. So, if I make this variable visible, then d1 and b1 will now belong to different sets. They will not belong to the same state of the abstraction, they will belong to different states of the abstraction. Now, in order to distinguish between uh, d1 and b2, okay, this variable is not going to distinguish between them because both of them are 1. So, let us choose another one, say this one. So, now if we take this and this, then together uh, this one, this variable helps us in distinguishing d1 from b1, this helps us in distinguishing from d1 and b2, right. Now, that is not an optimal solution, 
right. For example, if you just take the second one, okay, if you just take the second one, namely this one, then this one distinguishes D1 from both B1 and B2, right, because this is 0 and both of them are 1. So, choosing only this variable will suffice, right, okay. So, choosing only this and making it visible will distinguish between the dead end states and bad states in this example, right. So, this is the formal problem that we have the inputs are sets D and B, right, the state separation problem. We have sets D and B and we have to find out the minimal U such that for all D belonging to D, for all B belonging to B, there exists some U belonging to U such that d u is not equal to b u. In other words, that we want to separate these two set of states. So, we have to choose a minimal set of variables u such that if you take any member of d and any member of b, then in, in the u th dimension they are not equal, right. So, for every pair of uh, vectors that you choose from D and B, there is some dimension, some variable in U such that D and B do not have the same value for that particular state variable, okay. This is the problem that we want to solve. And the refinement H dash, the new refinement is obtained by adding U to V, okay, making U visible. Now, we are going to look at two different uh, methods for this state separation problem. One is an integer linear programming based method and the other is a decision tree learning based separation method. So, just let us quickly see the formulations of these two. So, suppose we want to separate with a decision tree learning. Okay. What is a decision tree learning approach? So, we are given this D and B, okay. we want to find out which variables to take so that you can distinguish between these states. This is a instance of a classical problem of partitioning a set of variables based on certain uh, features. So, you need to choose that which features should be there in your decision making so that you are able to distinguish between the acceptable ones and the non-acceptable ones. So, in other words, suppose there are several factors uh, on the basis of which you decide that when you go to a restaurant and you find that there is no available seat, then whether you will wait or not, okay. there are several uh, criteria for deciding that. So, for example, whether it is raining, whether it is likely that in other restaurants also you will have the same crowd and things like that. So, there are several features like that. Now, given us data which tells you that in which cases people waited and in which cases people did not wait and the values of all those features in those cases, the prop decision tree learning algorithm is to find out that which of these criteria like whether it is raining or whether uh, it is a Friday and things like that, which of these criteria can be is sufficient to give you a decision regarding whether you are you should wait or not right so similarly here we use that classical algorithm to learn that what should be the separating set of variables right so let's take for example this one okay so suppose we first choose v1 as the decision variable v1 is the first variable if we choose v1 as the uh, decision variable now if v1 is 0, then we have these two, okay, because in these two v1 is 0 and in these two v1 is 1, right. Now, when v1 is 0, 
then we have to further distinguish between D1 and B2, right? Because D1 and B2 cannot be distinguished by virtue of V1, right? Because they have the same value of V1. If you make V1 visible, then you still cannot separate D1 from B2, right? Similarly, if V1 is 1, then you need to separate between B1 and D2. So now you take this and now you choose V2 here, okay. To separate D1 and B2, you choose V2. So why do we choose V2? Because in V2, this and this are different, right. So if you choose V2, then if V2 is 1, then we know that it is D1, okay. And if V2 is 0, then we know that it is P2, right. So if V2 is 1, we know it is D1. If V2 is 0, then we know it is B2. On this side, V2 will not work. To distinguish between D2 and B1, you cannot take V2 because both in both of these it is 1. So which one do we have to take? V4, right, because here we have 0, here we have 1. Right. So we choose V4 and then if V4 is 0, then it is D2, V4 is 1, we have P1, right. So in the end, we basically need to make V1, V2 and V4 visible, right. That is what this decision tree learning algorithm gives us, right. Now the choice of the variables on the basis of which you will split is a very important consideration here. Right. If you choose a good one, then you get a, you can do with fewer variables, right. So that is what the decision tree learning algorithm actually helps you in doing, right. So this splitting algorithm is nothing, it is the outcome, right. The actual algorithm is how do you choose the variable on the basis of which you will first split the set of samples. So if you read up uh, AI uh, books on AI, then there are uh, several algorithms that are there to do this. Now, if we, we will not go into that discussion because it is, uh, it is going to, you know, really be out of the scope of this course right now. Right. So this is one class of algorithms. The other class so is separation with a zero one ILP. What is 0, 01 ILP? 0, 01 integer linear programming. Okay. Now let us see how this uh, is formulated. Now, first let me show the constraints, then we will uh, see what is the cost function. So, look at D1 and B1, okay. If you look at D1 and B1, then they vary in this position and this position, right, because you have 0 here, 1 here and 0 here, 1 here. In the remaining two positions, they are similar, right. So in order to distinguish between D1 and B1, we will have to bring in either V1 or V3, right. So, we write V1 plus V3 greater than or equal to 1, where what does variable V1 represent? If V1 is 1, then the variable V1 is, is chosen to be visible. If V1 is not chosen to be visible, then this variable V1 is 0, okay. So 1 means that it is chosen, 0 means it is not chosen. So if I take V1 plus V3, it has to be greater than or equal to 1. It can, if, if it is 0, then both V1 and V3 are 0. So we have not chosen V1, we have not chosen V3, but then we cannot distinguish between D1 and B1, right. If we choose both of them, then this will become 2. That is also fine because if we choose both of them, still we can distinguish between D1 and B1, right. Let us look at the separation from D1 from B2, from D1 and B2 the separation is, okay, they agree in the first one, 
okay they do not agree in the second one and they agree in the third and fourth variable. So, only V 2. So, that gives us V 2 greater than or equal to 1 right. So, it is like V 2 is essential right? you will have to bring it. No, we are just uniformly making this greater than or equal to everywhere right. V 4 because be in order to distinguish between D 2 and B 1 only V 4 can distinguish. So, V 4 greater than C. And then when you look at D 2 and B 2, well they are differing in all the bits. So, V 1 plus V 2 plus V 3 plus V 4 greater than or equal to 1. If you just make any of the variables visible, then you can distinguish between D 2 and B 2 right. Now, so these are the constraints and subject to that what do I want to minimize? I want to minimize the number of variables that I have chosen. So, I want to minimize sigma of v i. So, minimize sigma of v i subject to this right. Now, this is an integer linear programming problem because these can take only variables 0 and 1. We cannot give you give fractional variables for example. So, this is another formulation. So, this is the same thing written once again that uh, written in a concise form actually that was an example minimize sigma of v i subject to that for all d belonging to d for all b belonging to b ok summation over the v i's which v i's the d b differ at v i ok that is what we did in the previous case right. So, subject to this set of constraints we want to minimize the sum of this. So, this is the generic formulation of the problem. So, for systems of uh, realistic size it is not really possible to generate D and B because these two sets will be very large right and it is very expensive to separate D and B. So, what do people do? They sample D and B. So, you just pick up randomly some sample from D and some sample from B right and then choose certain variables that that are needed to distinguish between these. So, you take a sample of uh, vectors from D take a sample of states from B and then over this sample you apply this algorithm and determine which variable should be brought in ok. Now, let us understand carefully what is happening. We are not looking at the whole of D and B we are looking at sample of D sample of B and then generating out the set of visible variables which distinguish between these samples right. Based on those visible variables we again refine the abstraction and repeat the model checking procedure on the abstract state machine. Question is, is this sound and complete? So, it is sound because all we are doing is we are just making some more invisible variables visible right. So, in the abstraction if again you find that the abstract state machine satisfies the property then the original machine still satisfies the property ok. And if the abstract state machine produces a counter example, we will again go back to the original machine and verify that counter example right. So, it is both sound and complete right. Only thing is that if you do not take the whole of D and the whole of B, the number of iterations that you go through may be larger A and B is that the number of variables that you bring into the abstraction may not be optimal. So, what might happen is that you lead you introduce too many variables into your visible set and again run out of capacity ok. So, the method is still complete counter examples will eventually be eliminated ok. Because when you bring in all variables and finally, if every variable has been brought into your set then obviously, false counter examples will not be there anymore. So, that is the extreme uh, situation. 
So, this is a picture of the CMU cigar tool. So, uh, just let me re repeat that most of the slides that I have presented in this topic, they are from Anubhav Gupta's presentation, uh, which was made in FMCAD uh, 2002 or 3, I think. So, that is when the counter example guided abstraction refinement approach was proposed. And the algorithm that we talked about here for the state separation and all that where uh, I mean or formulating it in that form in terms of bringing in new variables was part of Pankaj Chauhan and uh, other members of the same group. Uh, okay. So, this is their uh, CIGAR tool. So, new SMV is the model checker okay. and cadence SMV is the, the actual model checking tool which does the model checking there. And, uh, this is where we the state separation problem is solved using an LP solve. LP solve is a uh, ILP solving tool, okay. And uh, shaft Z shaft or shaft is the shaft checking engine, okay. To verify, you need the shaft checking engine to verify whether your counter examples are true, okay. So, shaft is actually what gives you returns you the dead end states and the flat states, right. Now, so with that we come to the end of this section on counter example guided abstraction refinement. Now, in addition to this, there is a lot of other uh, things that people do while making model checking more effective. So, the things that we studied so far are really part of the model checker itself, right. For example, Counter example guided abstraction refinement is an iterative version of the model checking algorithm, where you progressively enlarge the state machine and, and check the property, right. There are a lot of manual intervention that becomes necessary in order to make the model checking practically feasible. And that includes things like adding more constraints on the environment as assumed constraints. And assume constraints can help in pruning out parts of your state machine and making the model checking problem more feasible. Okay. Then people also do things like checking properties on smaller modules and then taking those properties and trying to infer properties on the integration of those modules. Okay. So, a thing which is called uh, the design intent coverage paradigm. And then there are issues like Whenever you are not able to complete formal verification totally, you cannot, you, you may not be able to do formal verification completely because of two reasons. One is that you did not write sufficient number of properties. Right? So, whatever was your complete functionality, everything you could not express in terms of properties, you have missed some properties. If you miss some properties, then those are not going to be verified. So, that is one thing to know whether I have written sufficient number of properties. The other thing is that even if I have written a property, I may not be able to verify it completely because of capacity problem, right. So, then there are approximate methods of model checking that will not be able to tell you that it is completely verified on the whole system. But we will say that we, okay, this is the percentage of the paths that I have covered. Right? So, you can even do uh, checking of the properties on the simulation traces or using you know formal in pockets. So, these are called semi formal verification techniques, right. So, they are very useful in practice, but they do not give you a complete guarantee that the property is satisfied on the model. Now, now, that these two things brings to, together a very important requirement is given that I have written a set of properties and given that I have been able to cover so many paths of the design to check these properties, what is the coverage, functional coverage that I have obtained by virtue of this verification. So, this comes under the ambit of formal verification coverage, which is a subject on its own. Okay. So, there are several issues like that and also consistencies of specifications, whether the specifications themselves are 
consistent. So, consistency and completeness, both of these will have to be looked at. Okay. So, these are the issues which are becoming very important these days. And in addition, the notion of properties is now beginning to spread into other domains like analog mixed signal verification. There is a recent Accelera subcommittee which is working towards formalizing the language standards for mixed signal properties. So, where you have real valued variables, you can talk about voltages, currents and their uh, constraints over those over time, right. So, that they, these are exciting new things that are happening in the uh, formal, semi-formal and assertion based verification um, families, okay. So, with that we end this lecture, thank you.